Turn to Genesis chapter 11. That's where we're going to be in just a moment. If you have the outline, the verses will be there for you. And I have one thing to say about the outline. If you got here a little bit late, you got the outline with the answers in them. I started printing them out, and I printed up like 25 copies, and I had to go stop the printer real quick because I realized I forgot to take all the answers out and put the blanks in there. So as people were coming in, I was offering them the ones with the answers, and only a few people took them. Most people wanted the ones with the blanks. So that's the, the explanation there. If you happen to get one with the answers in it, that was my mistake. I'm sorry for that. I like watching war documentaries sometimes, and I watched one in particular that made me realize something that the Bible is very good at. I was watching this war documentary about World War II, and it would show what was happening in the Japan side, and then it would show what was happening on our side. And because it was doing this after the fact, it was piecing it together, and so you knew the outcome, but yet you, could, you were riveted to, all right, they're doing this, and wonder what the Americans are doing while they're doing that. I'll come over here and show what the Americans are doing. And then we'll go back over here and show what the Japanese were doing. And I was just amazed by how sometimes it was just a very small thing, a very small decision by one or two people that had a huge impact in how the war turned out. And if they had made a decision that was just slightly different, the whole war might have changed and the outcome could have been different. The Bible gives us so many good things to look at about this amazing war that is taking place between God and the devil. And you, as we look at this, and we have history, and we have the book of Revelation that teaches us God wins and his people win, you're reading the Bible sometimes, you're saying, hey, don't do that, don't do that. All right, we know how this turns out, and if you make that decision, it's going to be disastrous for you. And we might read, hey, yeah, go ahead and do that. That's a good decision. And so as we go through some of these amazing stories in the Old Testament that point us to Jesus, it was really just pointing them to someone. They weren't really sure who this someone was and all the details of this someone, but they knew that in the future, the seed of woman was going to come to make everything different, was going to make a big difference. And we noted that last week with Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and how God pronounced a punishment on Adam and Eve and on the snake and then on the devil himself. And he said to the devil, there will always be enmity between you and the seed of woman. And one day there will be a seed of woman who will rise up. And yes, you will bruise his heel, but he is going to bruise your head. I will win. But I'll tell you what, we learn about the devil. Something sort of scary. Because as Brian noted in his thoughts before we took the Lord's Supper, that when people witness just the small glimpse of God, they fall down in total fear of him. If they see a heavenly being like an angel, they fall down on the ground with their faces to the ground. Satan didn't do that. And this sort of shows us who Satan is, and we need to know this if we're going to have a victory against him. When God announces this curse on him, he doesn't hightail it out of there. He doesn't put that tail between his legs that can wipe out a third of the stars between his legs and leave. You know what he says? Next. Who are the next people I can go after? You have Cain and Abel. When they come on the scene, he goes after Cain and gets Cain to sin and kill his brother Abel. When that's over with and God decides to give Adam and Eve more children and Seth is born and God says, my promise is going to come through and it's going to come through Seth. The devil doesn't go away in fear. The devil wants to fight and he fights more. He fights so hard that at one point he has everyone in the world choosing to follow him except Noah. The devil is vicious. The devil works hard. The devil is perceptive. And I hate to share this bad news with you, but you have to know it if you're going to have victory over him through Jesus Christ. 
And so God says, I'm going to save this one righteous man and his family through the water. And he causes this flood and everybody else is wiped off the face of the earth. Once the flood is over and they come off the ark, it isn't long before sin comes into the picture, picture again. Noah gets drunk and Ham sees his father's nakedness. And we have there recorded for us that God tells them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. And they don't do that. They settle and they build this tower up to the sky. And they have that in the article in the bulletin today. I invite you to read that. And God comes down, no, you're not going to win. I'm going to get what I want. And so God changes their languages and they finally start to scatter and to fill the earth. Well, the rest of Genesis chapter 11 details the descendants of one of Noah's sons, and this is Shem. And when it comes down to all the descendants of Shem, it finally comes down to a guy named Terah. And Terah is important because Terah has three sons, Abram, Nahor, and I knew I was going to, I keep wanting to say Ham, and Haman, and Haran. So those are the three sons that he has here. And these are important men because these men t- start the story of how God is going to fill the promise. Now, Haran had a son named Lot. And Haran died before his father does. So Terah takes responsibility for Lot. And so you have Terah, and Terah takes Abram, takes Lot, and takes Sarah. And they are told by God to leave where they are and to go to a land where God is going to show them. And they settle in Haran. Now, I got to tell you something very important. If you don't see that chart, that's in the outline. You can look at that now or you can look at it later. It's a very neat chart about how all these families go together and how God's going to fulfill a promise through them. But I got to tell you something about Terah. Terah was an idol worshiper. Abraham's dad worshiped idols. We know that from Joshua chapter 24 in that famous passage where Joshua is going to go about and he's going to talk about how you choose you're going to serve, but me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. At the beginning of that text in Joshua 24 in verse 1, it says, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel for their heads and their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Now the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what kind of a relationship he had with these other gods. And why Abraham doesn't seem to be lumped into this idol worshipers at all. Jewish tradition tells a story where Abraham's father, Terah, was actually, he had an idol shop. He sold idols. Now, this isn't in the Bible. This is Jewish tradition. And Abraham was left in charge of that shop one day. And his father left. And Abraham takes a hammer, busts up all the idols. Because he didn't believe in idols. And he takes that big hammer and he puts it in the hands of the biggest God that was there. And so his father comes back in and says, what has happened? And Abraham points to that big idol and says, he did it. And at that moment, Terah realized there can't be idols because that idol couldn't do anything. And that's not in the Bible. That's Jewish tradition. But we do know from Scripture that Terah was an idol worshiper And Abraham is never said to be an idol worshiper. Let's read Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your father and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
So while in Haran, the Lord appeared to Abraham and told him to continue to the land of Canaan. Now, I want you to notice something about this. We oftentimes put this promise into three different categories, and I think that's good. I think there are three different specific things that are mentioned here that are important for us to dwell on. There's a land promise, a nation promise, and a seed promise. But you, Abraham, maybe the most important part to Abraham was God just simply saying, I will bless you. God says to Abraham, I will bless you. And we see that going through Abraham's life. I mean, even the land promise was going to be far in the future. The seed promise was going to be even further than that. But what he could take heart in at that particular moment, every single day of his life, that the God of the universe said that he would bless me. And he said that he will bless those who bless me. And he will curse those who curse me. And one day I will be a blessing. All the nations of the world were going to be blessed through Abraham. All those promises that he gave were really focused on that seed promise. The land was just, this is where the nation's going to live. The family was just, this is the lineage I'm bringing it through, him through. But the main thing is that Christ was going to come. And we noted this last week, but I think this is so important. What started out as a curse on Satan became a promise to Abraham and a blessing to us. When you read Genesis chapter 3 and you hear what God says to Satan, he is actually blessing you when he says that. That's a blessing to us. So Abraham leaves. He goes to Canaan. When he gets to Canaan, he goes around the territory of Canaan, and he looks at it. He sort of, sort of spies it out, if you will, and he ends up in Shechem. And so in chapter 12, verse 7, God appears to him again. He says, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had a, appeared to him. And then he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. So as Abraham traveled this land, God reassured him that all the land he saw would belong to his descendants. So let me just take a break here just for a second to let us know how important this is. Genesis chapter 3, in the seed of woman, there is going to come one that will bruise the head of Satan. In Genesis chapter 12, he's narrowing it down to the actual family that that one is going to come from. And the rest of the Bible is going to follow that family and that land until they get to that one that is going to bless all the nations of the world. So not now, not only does history wait for the seed of woman who is going to smash the head of Satan, the, the history knows now that that seed of woman is coming through this family, a very significant thing that we have to understand. There are several times that God confirms this promise to Abraham and he's going to confirm it to Isaac. He's going to confirm it to Jacob to let them know this is going to happen. So in Genesis chapter 13, we have the account where Abraham becomes so wealthy, he and Lot, that they have to separate ways. And we know the story there. Abraham is so good at this. He says, Lot, you choose. Lot chooses the land that he thought was going to be the best for him. It turned out that it wasn't. And Abraham was going to take what was left. After Abraham does this, God appears to him again in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after a lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered." Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Now somebody, as Brian pointed out to us, calculated how long that was or how many sands of the seashore there was. That's a lot. 
And the point wasn't the actual number. The point was he was going to have a huge family. After Abraham and Lot separated, God appeared to him again, confirming his promise to give him a large family and a fertile land. Chapter 14 of Genesis records Abraham saving Lot, and he meets Melchizedek. Let's look at chapter 15. Chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, if you're doing the crossword puzzle, you probably want to circle that word shield, because that's one of the answers. Verse 2, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, You have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside, and he said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So after Abraham saved Lot, God appeared to him again, telling him that Eleazar is not going to be his heir, and that the heir that he's talking about is going to be his biological son. And I think this is a wonderful picture. Could you imagine being Abraham here? I mean, you're, you're, you're not sure how this is going to come about. You're saying, let it be Eleazar. I don't have any heirs. I'm getting too old to have heirs, okay? Let it be someone born in my house. And God says, no. And God takes you outside. And no offense to where we live in Orlando, but you don't see a lot of good nights where there's a lot of good stars, right? Sometimes if you go out where there's not a lot of big cities, you go out in the middle of the country and you look up at the sky and you just see all these stars. And I can just imagine Abraham looking up there and a very clear night and seeing all those stars being so impressed with this promise that God gave him. His descendants would be without number. And then in chapter 16... You have that whole story with Hagar and Ishmael. And most of us know that story. They're trying to figure out another way. God doesn't know what he's doing, they're thinking. And this is the man of faith, right? And he goes in, he has a child with Hagar, and then he's trying to say, God, just let it be, just let it be Ishmael. Let it be Ishmael. Let's get this thing done. Let's get the ball rolling. I don't have the time to wait for you to fulfill this promise. Look at chapter 17 now in verse 5. Genesis 17, verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In this section, God confirms his covenant again with Abraham, and he gives him a sign of the covenant, and that sign of the covenant is circumcision. At this particular point in the story, Abraham is 99 years old. Ishmael is 13 years old. Abraham actually laughs and encourages God, just use Ishmael. Use him to fulfill the promise. God says no. And he blesses Sarah and tells Abraham that the nation and the seed promise is not going to be fulfilled through Ishmael. It's going to be fulfilled through someone who actually comes from the body of Sarah as well. So now we know something else about this one who's going to rise up one day and conquer Satan. It's going to be Abraham's descendants and Sarah's descendants. It's going to come from both of them. We're going to skip now for a second. We're going to skip ahead, and we're going to look at where this promise was confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob, and then we'll come back and look at where it started 
with Isaac in just a moment. So look at Genesis chapter 26. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land. He's talking to Isaac now. And I will be with you and bless you. And to you and your descendants I give all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I shall, will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Notice what happens to those who don't obey the voice of God, don't keep his charge, don't follow his commandments, his laws, and his statutes. Well, at one point, they were wiped out in the flood. God says, Abraham keeps them, and I'm keeping my promise with him. God gave the same three-part promise to Isaac because of Abraham's obedience. And then you have the story of Jacob's ladder in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 13. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 13, where the Bible says this, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So Jacob gets the same promise. Through his seed, all the nations would be blessed. So now we have it narrowing down even more. First of all, in Genesis 3, it's just going to be the seed of woman. Well, in Genesis 12, it's going to be from Abraham. And as that story unfolds, Abraham and Sarah... And as the story goes further, it's going to be from Isaac's seed. And it goes further, it's going to be from Jacob's seed. Now we're getting this piece together of this one who is going to destroy the devil, whose family he is going to come from. So we're going to take a step back now and go back to Genesis chapter 21 and see where this promise starts to be fulfilled. Genesis chapter 21. After Abraham laughed, after Sarah laughed, about this happening because they were so old. Genesis 21 and verse 1 says this, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah born to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, before we answer these blanks, I just want to make this point of emphasis. Because there's going to be a huge contrast between how the first son of promise comes into the world and how the real son of promise comes into the world. When the first son of promise comes into the world, he's coming into the world to old parents. Huge celebration. I mean, there was a party when he was weaned. I mean, he had everything. Just this huge celebration. We have been all these years. Abraham is 100 years old. And, though, and, and Sarah makes this point that, man, no one would have believed this. No one would say that I would have children, that I would nurse children. Here I am, 10 years younger than Abraham, but I am old and I am well beyond the, the chance to have children but I am having children. 
It was a very special blessing. And the other thing that we need to note here, in way of contrast to the one that we're really waiting for in history, Isaac enters the world to rich parents. And we'll note that later when, when Christ enters the world. This morning at about 3.30, as I was lying in my bed unable to sleep, I thought about some other things I wanted to share with you. The story that we're reading and talking about, it depicts Satan in a very, very aggressive way way in which he's bad news. And so I was thinking about Satan this morning, and I want to bring out some points to you before we look at some other lessons. The devil is the biggest narcissist the world has ever seen. You ever have any dealings with narcissists? They're difficult to deal with. A narcissist thinks the whole world revolves around them. The devil thinks everything revolves around him. He's trying to destroy God in every single one of us. And he has nothing to lose. So that a narcissist is running loose with nothing to lose, that's dangerous. For those of you who haven't had a lot of dealings with narcissists, the best visual that I've ever heard to describe a person like this is someone who is playing with dolls when they're child, a child or action figures if they're boys. And they control everything in that environment. They control the dollhouse. They control where these dolls sit. They control what they eat and what they do. And they're just grown-ups who are still trying to control everything. And will do whatever they can to be in charge. That's what the devil is like. He is doing everything he can to be in charge and to win this battle over us. And we can't let them do that. Now, there's something, and this is where I think there's some real practical things for us to think about. If you read about how to deal with a narcissist, one of the things is become a gray rock. It's, the, it's a strategy, the gray rock strategy. And what that strategy says, just be uninteresting to the narcissist. If you're uninteresting to the narcissist, they'll go mess with somebody else and get their narcissistic supply from them. Sometimes I think as Christians, and I can just tell you, sometimes I've done this and I got to fight it. Sometimes when it comes to the devil, I don't want to stand up to him. I just want to be a gray rock. I just want to be Someone, the devil will say, he's boring. I'm going to move on to someone else. But here's the problem. Gray rocks are not useful to God. The devil might leave you alone if he doesn't feel like you're a danger to him at all. If he doesn't feel like you're doing anything valuable to God, he might just walk away from you, allow you to live your life the way you want to live it because you're not, a, you're not a danger to him. You're not interesting to him. And this is what we have to fight. We have to fight the urge of making a deal with the devil where we say, we will be uninteresting if you'll leave us alone. We'll come to church. Just let us come to church. That'll ease our conscience. Just let us do some things that, that other people will think we're not gray rocks, the people that we're trying to impress. Let us have our houses. Let us have our cars. Let us have our families. Just leave us alone. Just leave us alone. And we're not useful to God. If you're sitting in the audience this morning and you're trying to get the devil to leave you alone by becoming a gray rock, Stop it. Because God tells us how to get the devil to go away. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
You have to fight the devil to get him to go away from you, which is not our instinct. When you have this big, powerful being that has caused most of the world throughout all of history to choose him and to forsake the Lord, sometimes we just want to sit there and say, okay, we'll just be this little rock. We'll just do the things that we can do. And we're not bold enough to say, I will resist the devil. I will work for God. I will be useful to him. And I will resist the urge to not fight. And I will stand and I will do what I need to do. We got to be those people. That's the only way we're going to have victory. And I started thinking about what we're studying in the book of Revelation, especially these letters to the churches and the one that Brian didn't cover today. The Laodiceans, they wanted to be gray rocks. They wanted to be lukewarm. So what does a church who wants to be gray rocks look like. They come to buildings like this. They meet with people that they agree with. And they're happy. Not really going out into the world and sharing the message of Jesus Christ as long as the devil will leave them alone. How many churches are out there that the community has no idea that they're there. We don't want to be that church either. We don't want to be the church that just sort of says, let us have peace and unity only, and let us just enjoy one another, and that's the extent of it. And if you will do that, God, we'll be happy. That's not what we want. That's not where our shepherds are taking us. It's scary when you tell the devil, I'm not going to be a gray rock. And as a church, we tell the devil, we're not going to be a gray rock. We're going to resist. We're going to stand for the truth. And we're going to go out and try to make as many converts to Jesus Christ as we can. Because I'll tell you what the devil's going to do. The devil's going to use the tool that he has at his disposal, that he has been using from the beginning of time, and something that we found from the story of the, the Tower of Babel that can be a huge tool. He's going to try to make us not be united. We know that. We know the ploy of the devil before we start, right? And so he's going to come in and try to divide us, and we have to say, that's not going to happen. We're going to resist his efforts to divide us in any way. Look at their society today. Our society is in total chaos. Our country is in chaos because of division and the lack of unity and one ver people fighting against another group of people and everybody being on different pages. The devil wants to bring that into PSD, and the more that we say no, the harder he's going to try. But we can't tell him, just leave us alone, and we'll be happy meeting in this building a couple times a week, having associations with one another, and doing what makes us feel good, not what God wants us to do. Now, I say all that, and that seems like, oh, man, that's a lot of bad stuff. I mean, the, but I'm telling you, the devil is bad. The good news is he doesn't win. And as long as we are on God's side, we will win. We will have success because God will be with us. Every story in the Bible points to that direction, and the book of Revelation really hits it home. Now, I do want to give you a little bit more positive things to think about as well. I mean, by way of practical application, I put this on here on Thinking Deeper, the last thing there. I just beg you, and just beg you, to sign up for the porch meetings. This is an attempt by our shepherds to lead us in a direction that is good and positive and to start setting some, make sure that we're grounded in unity first. And if we're united and we're doing what God wants us to do, we can do a lot of good things. So by way of, I'm just asking everyone to come to Herb's porch for an hour on the days assigned. So go outside and sign up today. I, it, either, and, it, and I'll tell you what, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for the elders, but I think I can say this and they can stand up right now if they want to and say, no, that's not true. 
if, there, if that time doesn't work for you and there are other times where you can spend some time and getting to know the elders better and let them get to know you better, they will figure out a way to make that work. So if they have to change and have two services on, two sessions on Sunday instead of one, they'll do that. If they have to do one the next Sunday, they will do that. Just let them know. And so I beg you to do that. Now back to the good news as it comes from what we've talked about today, where it looks like, man, Satan wins all the time. He doesn't. We know that, right? He ultimately will lose. And if we're on his side, we will win. Sometimes we can get so down in the dumps about our country. And I'm telling you, it's not nearly as bad as we think it is. It's not nearly as bad as it was in Noah's time. I mean, there are people, there are churches that are holding fast to this book all over the world. And they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And there are people who are in buildings today who we may not have a lot of spiritual connection with, but we can't see them as our enemies. That's one of the things we're trying to point out, right? The people aren't our enemies. People are never our enemies. And they may not be worshiping God exactly the way that we worship God and believe the way that we believe, but there are still a lot of good people out there who believe Jesus is the Christ that we need to go talk to. And we need to not put so many lines or barriers between us and them. We need to talk to them. We need to see if we can figure out common ground in this book so they can serve God the way that we believe God should be served. All is not lost. God is still in control. He is still in charge today like he has been every other day since he created the world. And regardless of how much progress Satan makes, he will not win. You will win if you stick with God. And that's what we got to do. we got to stick with God. If you're in the audience today and you have never become a Christian... You've never decided, I'm going to be on God's side. You're serving that devil. And he might make deals with you. He might make your life enjoyable and good and protect you from certain things. But you don't want him as your father. But ultimately, his only goal is to destroy you. Remember, he's a narcissist. He doesn't care about you. He's trying to destroy you. Leave him. Become a Christian. Serve God. Let him be your father. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're a Christian, I want you to look really hard at your life, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I been a gray rock? Have I just been existing, trying to not draw the devil's ire, and I haven't stood out in faith and said, I will resist you, devil, because I have God on my side? If anybody needs prayers or need a, needs a way to come back to the Lord and restore that relationship, we are here for you and you can come right now as we stand and sing.